focus on the breath. We want to be friends with the breath. Which means that you have to be friendly to the breath. The breath just sits there, comes in, goes out. Pretty much responds to your activities, the activities of the mind. And there's a part of the body that tends to be shy. Feelings in certain parts of the body that are going to take a while to open up to you. There may be spots in the body where the breath energy seems totally sealed off, which may be because you've manhandled it in the past, so it doesn't quite trust you. It's like it's another person in there. So to be friends with the breath. You approach it by being very observant. Think of how you make friends with somebody else. You say a few things and see the response, and you say a few other things see the response. You do a few things together. Get a sense of the other person. You know, with friendships with human beings, we have the choice to say, well, maybe after all this isn't the sort of person you would want to be friends with, but with your breath you better be friends. It's what keeps you alive. It's one of the last things you'll be aware of when you go. And so you want to be on good terms with it all the way. So what are the techniques in approaching the breath? It's interesting to note that in John Lee's descriptions you work with finding a spot in the body where the breath seems comfortable, and then you spread your awareness from that spot. And let the bread, excuse me, let the breath spread from there. And there are other times in his instructions where he has you work with breath in different parts of the body, this section, that section, and finally let them meld together. But the general pattern is you start small and you move large. The Buddha's approach was just the opposite. You get aware of the breath. Notice when it's long, notice when it's short, and then the very next step is be aware of the whole body. And then from there you work with the breath. As he says, you calm bodily fabrication, which means you calm the effect that the breath has on the body. But before you can calm it, you have to give yourself a sense of energy, what he calls rapture, which can be translated as also as refreshment. A sense that the breath energy is filling. It saturates the body and it feels good. It feels like you've had a good charge of energy, food. And you're perfectly content to stay right there. As you get deeper into concentration, this sense of rapture or refreshment will go stronger. In the beginning it may be very light. But there's a sense that you don't really feel the need to go anywhere else. That's what you're looking for. Now, as I said, in some cases, as John Lee recommends, you want to start small and work large. Or you might do it the other way around. Try to be aware of your whole body. And then notice what happens when you're aware of the whole body, how your sense of the breath changes. This can be especially useful if you have a tendency to push things around too much inside. A lot of people complain that they can't find any comfortable breath anywhere in the body. There must be some place where it's comfortable, otherwise you'd be dead. But there is a problem when you tend to push the breath too much, force it too much. Pinch off the end of the breath, squeeze it out, force it in. What we sometimes do is to create a little tension around the end of the in-breath and the end of the out-breath to mark it. This is especially a tendency when you're beginning to meditate. You want to be clearly where now the breath is coming in, now it's stopped, now it's going out. Well, it doesn't have that clear a marker. The energy flows in and there's kind of a stillness and then it flows out. And there's another stillness. And the question is, how long an in-breath feels good, and when does it stop feeling good? As soon as it stops feeling good, you don't squeeze it anymore, you just allow it to stop. 
and then it'll go out on its own eventually. Again, you don't have to speed the process up to make it clearer or to make it more precise. Breath as energy doesn't have very clear boundaries, and it can really penetrate anywhere. If you find that in trying to manipulate the breath there's a sense of pressure, you're actually working with what the Buddha calls the water element or the liquid element. In other words, the blood and the body is being pushed up against something that's solid inside and it's not going to move and the pressure builds up. If you've been doing that, think of the pressure going the other direction. There's a sense of the energy coming up into the head and getting stuck there. Try to think of all the channels in the neck being open. And you'll find that you have a subconscious tendency to pull energy up in the neck as you breathe in. And so you have to paint a picture in the mind that says, no, it's going to go down. Then you don't force it down, you just think, allow it down, permit it to go down. Open your mind to the possibility that it can go down. And wherever there's any tension in the neck, think of it relaxing. That might be what's blocking off the ability for the energy to flow down. And then don't do anything more than that. That's why when you treat the breath gently, and you treat it from an all-around perspective, it begins to settle down. So you're not there squeezing it, you're actually putting most of your effort into maintaining this full body awareness, which frees the breath to do what it can in the space of that full body. Now, as I said earlier, there may be spots in the body that don't seem to be responding. Maybe you have to be patient with them. They've been pushed around a lot in the past, especially with the areas around the heart, areas around the stomach that we've tended to squeeze in the past when we're nervous or upset or trying to bottle up an emotion. Well, there it is. It's all bottled up. We succeeded. But now it's a pain. Now it's something that's actually in the way. So you're trying to unbottle it, which means you have to be very gentle around it. And be very, very patient. If it doesn't respond right away, then just leave it for the time being. Work on the parts of the body that do respond. And as you get familiar with them, you're on friendly terms with them. Other parts of the body will open up, be more willing to be friendly too. Now the Buddha talks about two kinds of friends that are worth keeping, worth looking for. The what he calls admirable friends and loyal friends. So loyal friends are the ones that are there for you all the time. That's the Buddha said, when you're heedless, they'll look after you. When you have sadness, they'll try to cheer you up. They'll be sad with you and do what they can to cheer you up. Other kinds of friends, what he calls admirable friends, those are the ones who are good examples, the kinds of things you want to aspire to. Now here with the breath, you've got a potentially loyal friend. So you've got to be the admirable friend for the breath. Direct it in ways. Direct your mind in ways as it relates to the breath. So it's not to be too impatient. to give it some time. And to be very observant. Notice when you are trying to adjust the breath, are you treating it in too heavy-handed a way? What would that be? You're, again, you're putting pressure on it or forcing it in a direction where it really doesn't want to go. Or it, not to attribute a will to the breath, but at the very least, if it goes there, it's not going to be good. So back off. Give it some space. Take that full body perspective. 
and see how it changes your understanding of what's going on when you breathe in, when you breathe out. So the directions in breath meditation. Sometimes if something is not working for you, well, flip it around. The passages where John Lee talks about getting the mind centered on the breath and then evaluating it. In other words, trying to develop what he calls singleness of preoccupation first and then evaluate it. But sometimes you evaluate it to get to the singleness of preoccupation. There's no set order in which these things work. If working with the breath and the torso doesn't work, we'll start with the extremities. Work from the fingers on up the arms and the toes on up the legs. Learn to flip things around a little bit. If things aren't working, ask yourself well, what would be the opposite approach. And if you get results, it still counts as breath meditation. Because even though the major principles are the same for everybody, the nuts and bolts of how things work out will vary from person to person, from session to session. And this is one of the ways in which you develop your discernment, is noticing if something's not working, what could you do to change? And open your mind to larger possibilities of what you could possibly do to change things. I mean, this is how the Buddha gained awakening himself. There was nobody there to teach him. How did he learn? He looked at his actions. He said, okay, these actions are not giving me what I want. What's another alternative? Came up with another alternative. He tried that. When that didn't work, he tried something else. But again, he kept referring everything back to his actions. Didn't blame somebody outside or some higher power outside or whatever. So I said, what am I doing? What can I change? And even when you get instructions from someone else, you have to flip them around a little bit. Because it's always possible that your understanding of the instructions is wrong, it's backwards, for some reason or another. Or it doesn't quite mesh with what you're doing right now. So give it the benefit of the doubt. And in this case, benefiting it with doubt means asking yourself, what if I try it the other way around? I went through a period one time when I found it very difficult to breathe. Again, in meditation, everything just seemed to be clamped down. And John Fuang was far away. It was a month or so before I saw him. So I mentioned this to him. And he said, well, you're focused on the earth element. Focus instead out on space. And that solved the problem right there. So sometimes our problems are due to things that we don't really know we're doing. I was holding the perception of earth someplace in my head. And that was getting imposed on the body. And then thinking of the body as just being really solid, and then it seemed impossible to squeeze the breath into this lump of solidity. So you can think of the space in the atoms, or you can think simply of the fact that your experience of the body is primarily energy. You look at the body in the mirror and it's sol solid. You hit it against things and it's solid. But how you feel it from inside, that's energy. So don't use your perception of solid to squeeze the energy around. Think of energy as already there. It's the first thing you know. It's the closest thing. And as John Lee always said, you want to be really good friends with the things that are really close to you. You don't want to be like that character in Bleak House, who was always worried about the children in Africa and was neglecting her own children. Your breath is the most immediate thing you experience in life. It's your direct experience of the body, and through, through the breath you experience your senses. 
So breath is prior. So be on really good terms with it. Because you're on bad terms with the breath, and it skews your relationship with everything else. The problem simply is that the breath is so close to us that many times we misperceive it. It's almost like it's too close for us to focus on, or we haven't bothered to focus on it because we're interested in things further away. And so it takes a while to back up, back up, back up, and get into this immediate experience of the breath. Observe it and be on good terms with it. So it really can be our friend. <laughs>